the Snowy Mountains, Australia's highest wilderness. Home to our tallest peak, Mount Kosciuszko. And to a variety of rare and endangered species found nowhere else on the planet. But it's a foreign species that has captivated the hearts and minds of the Australian public and divided popular opinion. Wild horses have etched their way into Australia's cultural identity and in doing so have been affectionately renamed Brumbies. Over time, we've altered the way we view the land and the best means to manage it. All the while, wild horses have roamed, survived and have thrived in the harsh backcountry of Kosciuszko. This is a story of how things have changed and in the face of that change, how wild horses have become more than just horses. Horses arrived in Australia on the first fleet in 1788. As more ships arrived, these original pioneering steeds would become the Brumbies we now know through the negligence of one Sergeant James Brumby. He would allow his mongrel pack of mixed breeds to roam free in the untamed landscape of early Australia. In lieu of fencing and fixed breeding, the bloodline beginnings of the now heritage Brumby began to form. In such a harsh landscape, only the fittest survived, and over time, the wild herds of Kosciuszko adapted and learnt to thrive in the geographically and environmentally harsh conditions of the Australian Alps. Settled in 1840, the snowy region was built on horseback. It was a time of exploration and discovery, and to have good horses was to have good economic and social security. Pastoralists would release domestic horses into the wild herds to bolster the diversity of the population. The wild herd was a viable commodity. It was a form of infinite currency to the locals. You just had to catch them. The mountains are dense. They provide cover and sanctuary for wild horses. Catching them required an equally wild and rugged person. Immortalized by the famous words of Banjo Patterson, Brumby running was used to manage numbers and utilize this economic value. It took skill, determination, daring, and it continued throughout the first half of the 20th century. But with the classification of Kosciuszko as a state park in 1944, this act of mythical heroism was discouraged and ultimately made illegal in 1983. However, Brumby running would continue, renegade style, in the face of conservation-focused academics and park officials. More people were visiting the park, and with the declaration of Kosciuszko as a national park in 1967, the way the area was viewed and utilised was changing. During this time, summer grazing leases for stock were phased out throughout the park. Times had well and truly changed in the mountains. Animosity between local practitioners and academically backed conservationists began to ignite, and at its core, a differing belief on how to best manage the land. In the early years of this conflict, the management of wild horses was off the radar, and they continued to live unmanaged within the park. It wasn't until the turn of the millennium, just after the mountain culture was immortalised on the World Olympic stage, that the issue of wild horses in the park was to be thrown into the spotlight. So, let's meet the characters in this story. We don't want to see any destruction, we don't want to see any damage, but we're looking at it literally from being on the horse's back. The environment has adapted to them and they have adapted to the environment. We're sitting here having this conversation because Brumbies are intrinsically linked with the culture of our country. They're a long, long way from ever being something that's integrated in that ecosystem. They're an icon of Australia. They're on the $10 note. Woo! I love the horses. I think they're beautiful. Um, but at the same time, I think there should be a lot less of them. They are the only feral animal that doesn't have a very well thought out and developed management control plan. I've got some very big concerns about how some of these horses are being treated and where they might end up. The various characters in this tale represent the different perspectives people have of the horses. These can be narrowed down to two groups, feral pests and brumbies. Consider the cultural links of local groups intertwined with the horses in question. Brumbies are a symbolic link to their feeding history. If you take that away, emotion builds, and this whole situation starts to become more than just an ecological issue of feral pest management. It is an emotional subject, but the thing is our heritage is emotional and they're a big part of it, particularly in this area of Australia. The most important part is, is the culture and the loss of heritage and the history behind the horse here in the Snowy Mountains. Um, that passion's never going to go anywhere. The horses are important to our cultural heritage, our history, and not only that, for future generations. Uh, 
who've grown to love the Brumbies through books such as uh, that of Eli Mitchell uh, the, the, and the, the film The Man from the Snowy River. All of those things are connected with the cultural history of Australia and in particular my family. For others, horses form a small part of Australia's culture. Horses do have cultural value. I think that's, that's well established. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean we have to have 10,000 horses roaming around the Australian Alps. Well, there are other ways to celebrate that culture than having um, than having horses destroying our, our natural heritage. When you talk about heritage, like, you know, it's not, it's not Aboriginal heritage, it's, it's white Anglo 150 years of heritage. A horse population that's only been there for 150 years and is separated from the horse in the paddock to a Brumby by nothing. Yeah, you, you need to call bullshit on the heritage side of things. They're, they're just horses. Although the National Parks Act emphasises conservation, there is a responsibility to preserve heritage. The National Parks Act establishes the importance of social and cultural heritage in our national parks. So in that aspect, that's, it's a very in intangible kind of thing. Unfortunately, Brumbies is a real hot potato and people often feel very strongly for and very, or very strongly against. For many, this issue is emotional and that drives attitudes and responses, especially online. This is a people problem as much as it's a, a horse problem. It is really difficult when people are emotional about an issue and people are certainly very passionate about horses in a way that, that seems to be a little bit different than almost any other species. It's a very difficult environment to make decisions in. The most relevant question in all of this is the impact. What is the ecological impact that the wild horses are having on the varying ecosystems of Kosciuszko? And is this impact enough to warrant their forced removal? I think it's total, frankly. The damage is just immense, widespread and increasing. Horses are having you know, very obvious negative impacts on a whole range of ecosystem processes and species. And when you walk out there, it's smashed. It's, it's, it's totally smashed. That vegetation does not look the way it should. Um, there should be large poetussics and massive, beautiful swamps, but you walk around out there and there's horse tracks smashing the banks of the creeks in. There's silt in all the creeks that should be crystal clear like the rest of the national park. Those horses, they stay in their one set area and they graze and they graze and they graze and those plants don't get a chance to revegetate and then the erosion kicks in and then it's a vicious process. There's the ethics associated with the unseen suffering. Broadtooth rats, all the, the range of skinks um, and any other animals that live in the habitat that, that are displaced by horses all undergo suffering. It's extremely unethical to drive species towards extinction or, or over the edge and, and make them extinct. That's what's happening by allowing these horses to roam around in our national parks. What's happening with horses is that they've adapted to the environment, but contrary to the claims of others, the environment hasn't adapted to them. So the backbone of the damage stems from the hard hooves and trampling nature of the horse's movements. And without a predator, they're free to graze all day, every day. But a horse is solely to blame. History tells a tale of many conflicting interests in Kosciuszko. Is the brunt of ecological damage unfairly positioned on the horse's back? Horses have a minimal impact in comparison to other things that are going on in the park, whether it be other introduced species like pigs or deer or rabbits or wild dogs or cats. But, you know, there's a whole snowy scheme that was built and um, roads and fire trails and sewage and, you know, so where's the emphasis and the focus on them? The Brumbies have adapted to the local environment and the environment has adapted to them. In fact, has become dependent on the Snowy Mountains Brumby, uh, particularly in regards to wildfire. The next bushfire that comes through, man, I'll tell you what, it's going to level the place. And what they, that's the other thing that horses help managing, okay, they can reduce fire loads. Next fire that comes through here, it's going to be awful, it's, it's going to be wildfire. It is still not Brumbies even in a half of the Kosciuszko National Park. And there's even places where the Brumbies are preferentially grazing the introduced grasses. So we actually see the Brumbies doing real good in some areas. We came into this wanting to advocate for Brumbies. And we very soon realised that we need to work with an ecosystem. And you can't target one isolated factor of an ecosystem without impacting everything else in that ecosystem. 
Both sides desire management and they care deeply for the environment. But in order to make effective management solutions, you need concise and informed scientific data as the backbone of your strategies. And the ecological impacts of the wild horses in Kosciuszko, it's simply lacking in this department. Government reports cite narrowly and they're biased to institutionalise ecological knowledge that doesn't quite reflect the complex nature of the issue. People then start to rely on observational data to fill in the blanks. And without a clear scientific structure, people then use observational data to validate their preconceived notions and to rationalise whatever they want to believe. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of good research that's been done, but it is in the grey literature. So it hasn't gone through um, a peer review associated with getting into a journal. And I think that is a, is a bit of a problem. Public servants are, uh, uh, have constraints put on them. They can't publish things in these really controversial areas. You've got to set up some different trials and compare methods on a large scale. None of this, oh dear, we need some more science and another five years to run it. Get in there and get some real action, but at the same time, be able to evaluate it. We need facts. Uh, we need accurate facts. During the time wild horses have been within the park, our understanding and methods of land management have changed. Transitioning from local practitioners to the government, there is concern that government structures do not utilise the lessons of local history and include enough unbiased public involvement. The greater knowledge that people have of the environment, the more likely they are to look after it. And the practical understanding that has been gained through generations of understanding of local people is often ignored by academics, and that's sad. What we need to do is to attract a situation where the people surrounding the area who have the practical experience with those who have the scientific experience to come up with a, uh, an understanding of what is the best management practices for the horses and the environment. That can be done. And sitting down like you guys are now, physically talking to those folk, getting their anecdotal evidence, seeing their photos, you know, like all that sort of stuff, and getting the real history, learning from the history of those people that were born and bred in this area, keeping that heritage alive. There's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of consultation in terms of words, but not enough consultation in terms of actual, actually getting stakeholder interest groups engaged. You know, putting the offer out there, if you'd like to be involved in the management of Brumbies, help us. There is a wide variety of opinion on the actual population and growth rate of the wild herd. The New South Wales government declared they wanted to reduce the numbers down from 6,000 to 600. This was met with vicious backlash. But just how many horses are in the park, and does it matter? So the idea that there are 6,000 horses in the park is, is framed as a working estimate. It, it could be a lot less, it could be a lot more. I mean, no one actually knows. But what is clear is that the numbers have increased and the impact have increased. So managing horses in the park shouldn't be about the number of horses. It's not the number of horses that are there, it's the impact of the horses that are there. Okay, so there's a population of wild horses in the park. Population surveys are flawed. No one can accurately say how many, but for the horses that are in the park, what's the current management plan? I'll tell you, it's passive trapping. Passive trapping involves luring horses into yards with salt licks or molasses. Once horses are trapped, they're either rehomed or they're put on the back of a truck and sent on a long journey to the knackery. A major concern within the 2016 National Parks Draft Management Plan was the lack of demand for rehoming, but rehomer Colleen O'Brien says there is a growing market for Brumbies. We've certainly seen an increase in, in homing Brumbies. We're finding that we're homing as many as we have the time to train every year. So we're homing around 45 a year. Um, on a, you know, on a busier year, we might home 60. Our issue is we're totally unfunded and there's not enough hours in the day. We're a volunteer, 100% volunteer run organisation and we just don't have enough time to train as many Brumbies as we would like to. Colleen is one of the good ones, but most horses don't get to experience her time, love and dedication. What are the other possibilities for those horses? And can we manage the herd humanely? The first conclusion that you can draw from looking at all these methods is there is no, thing, no method that doesn't have some kind of negative welfare impact on horses. Rounding them up is very stressful on the horses and nobody wants to see them get hurt. Culling them is really difficult after what happened at Guy Fawkes. Aerial culling is the only practical way to deal with the problem but 
but that can't be done either. So error culling is, is at the moment the only feasible method, and that's because it's, um, it's the most humane method. The aim of my involvement is to try and improve outcomes in the treatment of horses in the park. And that's why, as part of this consideration, uh, we also looked at methods that involved killing horses in the park itself. So that's ground shooting and area shooting. When they are carried out according to best practice, then the actual outcome of those can be more humane than some of these other methods that involve lots of stages. That's straight from the horse's mouth. The RSPCA supports aerial culling only when used to best practice. So why are people so against it? Aerial culling just wouldn't work in an environment like Kosciuszko National Park. It's heavily treed, it's really rugged. The ability to follow up and know that you have killed every fa individual in that family group, which can be done in a desert area, it cannot be done in Kosciuszko National Park. A method may be suitable in one environment, but not in another. So I know there's a great deal of concern around the idea of aerial shooting horses in a forested environment, and that, that's not something that um, we would advocate. The solutions that seem to make the most sense in all of this acknowledge the need for a diverse range of management tactics. Kosciuszko National Park is just so vast, it has a number of different ecosystems. Therefore, a single blanket solution to this issue just won't work. So we see the best way to manage Brumbies is like managing any other project is with a toolbox. One of the things that is working and working very, very well in the Long Plain Kyandra area is passive trapping. Long Plain is what we refer to as prime Brumby real estate. So you can use a place like that as a vortex and actually trap quite a lot of Brumbies because when you trap the Brumbies on Long Plain, the other nearby Brumbies will move in. They'll say, well, that's a great place to live and walk on there. So you can actually have a really successful trapping program in that area. Um, there are other areas where, for whatever reason, that wouldn't work. Fertility control is a product that can be used in, in quite remote areas where, for example, there's not an opportunity to actually catch brumbies and bring them out humanely. There are other things like um, passive musters. So we've observed musters in America that have been pretty quick and brutal, and we've observed the New Zealand Kamanawa wild horse muster, which is really, really well done. So there's the opportunity for national parks to partner with key stakeholder groups such as local horse riding and community organisations to run musters where those community organisations can then also support and assist with the homing of the horses caught there. And so that has a dual purpose. The horses are managed, the community groups are engaged in the park and it's a win-win. Throughout this whole story, it's plain to see the different perspectives people have for the wild horses. This manifests into different ideas about ecological damage, emotional ties, and cultural heritage. History tells the tale of how there's been a management transition from local practitioners to the government. Now pastoralists feel uninvolved and that a lack of respect is shown towards their accumulated knowledge systems. Without a precise and rigorous scientific model to help drive new management solutions, both sides are going to continue to dig their heels in. And without compromise, progress stalls. And if we look in the Brumby toolbox, you'll find we already have the solutions to effectively and humanely control this issue. So, what's holding us back? Media, bureaucracy, red tape, the political argument. Get out there, experience it, and get, get more of a, um, a feel rather than just talking about it, you know, like it's living and breathing and being in that area. Um, being able to experience it firsthand, that, um, that's something that I find we lack these days. The, the issue of managing the Brumbies would be much easier if there was less political content. The politics needs to get out of it. If you could take the politics out of it, I think you'd get, you, there would be a, a way of solving this problem. It's, it's because it's become a political issue. That's the stalemate. I think National Parks wonder, you know, why are we still having this conversation? You know, why can't we move forward? And I think um, part of the history of this is that National Parks are attempting, have attempted to manage Brumbies along the same lines as they manage other animals that they view as pest species in their national parks. We're sitting here having this conversation because Brumbies are intrinsically linked with the culture of our country. I give the park, you know, a lot of credit for knowledge on having to deal with this in a whole range of ways. I just wish government would get some um, bit of grunt and do something about it.
Wild horses aren't at fault. The fault is with management. We've changed the way we view wild horses, the environment, and how they interact together. Time travel doesn't exist, and we can't replicate the past. We've put fences along our highways, built large infrastructure, introduced exotic species, and have changed the ecology of Kosciuszko forever. What we can do is manage the land and appropriately plan for the future. How? By using the best available science to provide habitat, conserve biodiversity, and ensure appropriate control for invasive species.